Hello, I'm David Hardesty, and this lecture is the overview of international taxation of electronic commerce. In this lecture, we will begin our study of international taxation of electronic commerce with an overview of all of the issues we will be studying. Here are the objectives of this lecture. The primary objective is to provide an overview of all of the topics we will be studying in our exploration of the international taxation of electronic commerce. This lecture will present the topics in the order in which they will be studied. A secondary topic of this lecture is to begin the process of tying all of the topics together so that so as to provide students with a cohesive model of the international taxation uh, as it relates to electronic commerce. Let's first uh, take a look at the topics we will be studying. The first topic studied in uh, Unit 9 is the classification of income. Next, we move to the source of income, also in Unit 9. In Unit 10, we examine the rules for foreign taxation of outbound transactions. These are U.S. companies selling goods and services to foreign countries. And the U.S. foreign tax credit rules for such transactions. In Unit 11, we turn uh, things around and study the rules for U.S. taxation of inbound transactions, which involves sales by foreign companies to customers in the United States. In Unit 12, we examine the special rules for U.S. taxation of foreign corporations owned by U.S. taxpayers. In Unit 13, we study European value added tax. Our study will focus mainly on the tax as it relates to uh, U.S. companies. In 13, we will also briefly study transfer pricing as it relates to electronic commerce. The first topic which will be covered in Unit 9, will be the source and classification of income. In most countries, including the United States, the ability of a country to tax a company's income depends on whether the country um, is the source of that income. In addition, in the United States, the foreign tax credit, which is supposed to prevent U.S taxation of income already taxed in a foreign country applies only against foreign tax imposed on foreign source income. Because of the importance of the rules for determining the source of income, we will spend a fair amount of time on this subject. The first thing to know about determining the source of income under U.S. international tax law is different sourcing rules apply to different kinds of income. Because different sourcing rules apply to different kinds of income, in order to identify the source of income, we must first identify the class of income we are dealing with so that we know what rules to apply. For example, Webco, a U.S.-based company, transfers a copyright to Foreignco, a country X company. If the transfer constitutes a sale of the intangible, the copyright, which is an intangible, then ordinarily the source of the sale will be the United States. However, if the transfer constitutes a license of the intangible, then the source will ordinarily be country X. Thus, it is very important to know whether to classify the transfer as a license or a 
sale of an intangible. Because of the importance of the source and classification of income, an entire chapter in the tax, electronic commerce, taxation and planning, is devoted to this topic. And this will be our focus in this unit's next two lectures. The way to approach this area of study is to, do, to understand the classification of the income first. The text covers the basic U.S. rules for income classification, covering all types of income from inventory to services. These rules are binding on all taxpayers subject to U.S. taxation, including both U.S. companies doing business in the United States and abroad, and foreign companies selling products and services to U.S. Com uh, customers. The text addresses special rules for the classification of transactions involving computer software programs. These rules cover both physically delivered and electronically delivered software. The rules do not specifically apply to other digital products, but in some cases can be applied uh, by analogy to these products. Note, however, that the regulations proposed in 2019 would revise the software classification regulations, renaming them classification of transactions involving digital content, so that the same classification rules would apply to all digital content, including software. The text also covers foreign classification rules for software and other digital products. The text discusses the detailed classification rules issued by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. These rules were issued specifically to address the question and the classification of, of online services and digital products and are used primarily in classifying income in OECD countries, including the United States, where a tax treaty is involved. In most cases involving transactions between OECD countries, the classification of the transaction will be controlled by tax treaty, if the parties elect to use the tax treaty and if the treaty provides a specific rule. In the absence of a specific rule, classification will be controlled by the domestic rules of the countries involved. Once income is classified, then the rules specific to that type of income are used to determine the source of the income. In general, we will be studying only the U.S. sourcing rules. These rules will tell us, for U.S. tax purposes, what income of foreign corporations is sourced in the United States and thus potentially subject to U.S. tax. These rules will also tell us what income is foreign source income under U.S. tax law and is therefore potentially eligible for a U.S. foreign tax credit when the company is paying tax in other countries. It is important to note, however, that when a tax treaty is involved, the U.S. sourcing rules are often ignored in determining whether a U.S. company has income taxable in a foreign country or whether a foreign company has income taxable in the United States. The U.S. tax rules for sourcing income are usually ignored when the income is classified as business income under the treaty. Under U.S. tax treaties, business income is ordinarily taxable in a country only when it is attributable to a permanent establishment in that country. The attribution of income to a permanent establishment is determined under tax treaty rules and ignores the specific sourcing rules of domestic uh, tax laws of the countries involved. Our next area of study in Unit 10 is outbound transactions.
In our study, we are concerned primarily with two issues. The first is whether a U.S. company will be taxed in a foreign country on sales to customers in that country. And the second is whether the UN United States will allow a U.S. foreign tax credit against any tax paid in that foreign country. Let's cover the foreign tax credit first. When a U.S. taxpayer pays income tax in a foreign country, that taxpayer can receive a credit to reduce U.S. tax that would otherwise be payable on that income taxed in the foreign country. This income is referred to as foreign source income. Essentially, the credit is for the U.S. tax applicable to the income that would otherwise be double taxed. The tax paid in the foreign country is determined based on the rules in uh, the foreign country. We will discuss this in more detail in the next slide. A tax credit is available only on the foreign source income. Foreign source income is determined based only on U.S. rules. It is worth noting that there are instances where income taxed in a foreign country will not be foreign source income under U.S. rules. Now let's turn to the determination of taxability in a foreign country, which is also studied in Unit 10. The analysis of whether a U.S. company is taxable in a foreign country starts with whether there is a tax treaty involved. If there is a tax treaty, then taxability in a foreign country may be determined by that treaty and is relatively predictable. If, on the other hand, there is no treaty, then taxability in the country is determined based on that country's rules. It is important to realize, however, that as with the United States, Tax treaties usually operate to reduce the tax that is otherwise taxable under the uh, country's domestic tax laws. Therefore, if it is determined that tax is due under a treaty, we still need to examine the domestic tax laws of the foreign country to determine if tax is due under those laws. If tax is not due under those laws, then the treaty would not ordinarily operate to create a tax liability. If a U.S. company has business profits originating in a foreign treaty country, then the profits are taxable in that country only to the extent that they are attributable to a permanent establishment in that country. A permanent establishment is generally a fixed place of business through which the company carries on uh, core business activities, but it can also uh, arise in other ways. In addition, a U.S. company may be subject to foreign tax on non-business income, such as royalties in a foreign treaty country if the income arises from sources in that country, but non-business income is often exempt uh, in the foreign country under the treaty. If a U.S. company sells to customers in a non-treaty country, then taxability in that country is based only on that country's rules. A determination of taxability requires involvement of tax specialists in that country. In Unit 11, we turn to inbound transactions. Inbound transactions are sales by foreign companies to U.S. customers where the foreign companies are potentially subject to taxation in the United States. Like Outbound transactions, the tax rules applicable to the inbound transactions depend on whether the foreign company is a resident of a country with which the United States has a tax treaty. 
let's first discuss rules for foreign uh, companies that are residents of treaty countries. If a foreign company is a resident of a treaty country, then its business profits originating in the United States are taxed in the United States only to the extent that they are attributable to a U.S. permanent establishment in the United States. In addition, if a treaty is involved, a foreign company is subject to U.S. tax on non-business income, such as royalties, if the income arises from U.S. sources, but non-business income is often exempt in the United States uh, under the treaty. Now let's discuss the rules for foreign companies that are not residents of treaty com uh, countries. If a foreign company is not a resident of a treaty country, then its U.S. source business profits are taxable in the United States if they are effectively connected with the conduct of a U.S. trade or business. If a foreign company is not a resident of a treaty country, then its U.S. source non-business income is taxed in the United States. Moreover, this income is subject to U.S. withholding at source. The next topic, which, uh, which we will study in Unit 12, is U.S.-owned foreign corporations. The first issue we will look at in connection with U.S.-owned foreign corporations is the taxation of assets transferred to these corporations when they're formed. Transfers by U.S. taxpayers to foreign corporations are often taxable, where those transfers would not be taxable when made to U.S. corporations. Of particular interest to us is transfers of intangibles, since these assets make up a large part of the assets of an online business. The second major issue involves the direct U.S. taxation of income of a U.S.-owned foreign corporation. This issue is fairly easy since the rules applicable to all other foreign corporations discussed primarily in uh, Chapter 12 of the text apply equally to U.S.-owned foreign corporations. Uh, finally, we will examine the special rules for controlled foreign corporations. If a U.S.-owned foreign corporation is not taxed directly in the United States, its U.S. shareholders may be taxable in the United States on the corporation's income as if the foreign corporation was a pass-through entity. Such taxation occurs when the corporation earns certain types of income generally known as subpart F income, or repatriates its earnings to the United States. The final topics in our study of international taxation of electronic commerce are European value-added tax, or VAT, and transfer pricing, and these are the topics of Unit 13. We will examine the basic uh, European VAT rules. The reason we are studying European VAT is because the rules are well documented. The rules are the most advanced in relation to electronic commerce, and European repre Europe represents a huge market for online sellers. The study of European VAT will also serve as a foundation for further study of VAT rules in other countries. We will examine a number of facts patterns involving electronic commerce and see how the European uh, VAT rules apply. We will discuss the special European rules for sellers of digital products and online services, which uh, can cause U.S. sellers of such products and services to be taxed in the, in the European Union despite having no establishment in the European Union.
Our final topic in the area of international taxation, also studied in Unit 13, is transfer pricing as it relates to electronic commerce. Transfer pricing of electronic commerce is a vast topic, so our study will, will constitute only an introduction. However, it is important to an understanding of the taxation of electronic commerce to at least be familiar with, with the uh, basic tenets of this area of taxation. The first thing uh, to know is that this set of rules applies primarily to related companies doing business inside and outside of the United States. The purpose of the rules is to determine the amount of income earned by related companies that is taxable in the United States versus the amount of income taxable in foreign countries. The income determination is made by testing the value of transactions between related companies to ensure that they are priced at arm's length. That is, that the prices are the same that would be charged by unrelated companies. The last thing to know for purposes of this overview is both the IRS and foreign tax authorities have inherently vast powers to reallocate income among related companies to ensure that the pricing of transactions between companies conforms to the arm's length standard.